All right, in this homework assignment, we're going to take a look at stress intensity factor determination and abacus by J. Contour and Gross, specifically for linear elastic fracture mechanics. We're going to take a look at a simple two dimensional model of a double edge cracked plate with an axial load applied to it. We'll calculate stress intensity factor for that using some of the tools with an abacus. Then we're going to take a look, we're going to import a model, uh, a 3D model created by FEA Crack that has a corner crack in it. We'll see how the mesh looks for uh, the commercial software package FEA Crack, how they created it. We'll go through an FEA Crack demo so you have a little bit uh, uh, of knowledge about what that's about. And as part of this we're going to take a look at some abacus features we haven't talked about yet. Uh, partitions, seam, crack. We're going to try a star include and uh, looking at some XY data. I think we've done that a little bit already, but we'll, we'll see that. We can just pull off the K value, stress intensity factor value, from our data, right out of the history data from our analysis. So we're going to start off our analysis by making, <coughs> uh, keying in a few points. And we're going to use half symmetry in this model. I want to do that so we can show this seam feature so uh, let's say maybe this point right here is zero zero. So we're going to key that in. Um, maybe uh, up at top, let's use uh, zero comma one hundred. Over here, one hundred comma one hundred. Now I want to put this point in over here as well. Uh, so this will be one hundred comma zero. And then down here, uh, I guess that would be 100, comma minus 100, and then finally 0, comma minus 100. So we're going to key these points in. We're going to connect them up in our sketch and abacus, and then we're going to do a partition. Uh, we're not going to do that in the sketch. We're going to do this later, but we'll see how we're going to put a partition in here which will be the line upon which our um, crack is going to grow. And depending on how I set this up, we're going to subdivide this partition and end up with a split over here, or it might be over here. It just kind of depends on how we, we do that. But I'm going to shoot for this distance right here to be 10 millimeters. Okay, so this is going to be a 10 millimeter edge crack out of a total plate width of uh, 200 millimeters if we go this way. Now there are solutions for the stress intensity factor for this kind of situation. Uh, there really aren't any analytical ones that I know of for this particular geometry for finite width. However, there are numerical solutions. And if you have a small edge crack and a large plate, the geometry factor is about 1.12 so we should expect our stress intensity to be something like sigma, you know, where we have the remote stress here, sigma square root pi a, where a is the half crack length, or the edge crack length, times a geometry factor that we should expect to be something around 1.12. <clears throat> but we can, we can calculate that out based on some other people's results who have used numerical methods to determine this stress intensity factor in this situation. Okay, so now one thing to keep in mind when we do get our results for the stress intensity factor in abacus, we don't get the geometry factor directly out of it. What we get is the stress intensity factor. So that includes the value of the stress that we apply square root pi a and 1.12. So we still have to have an idea of uh, how that relates to kind of a standard geometry. If we want to pull out a geometry factor out of that, or if you just want the stress intensity, then it just gives that right away. All right, let me save this page and let's talk just a little bit more about uh, J integrals and stress intensities. All right, so we have a crack in a plate and we put some load on it. And this crack may have some impending urge to propagate. There's a certain amount of energy that is released by the extension of the crack. It's a formation of new crack surfaces. So this would have a tendency to 
extend and maybe grow out here just a little bit lo uh, longer. Maybe some small distance, we call, can call that dA. Well, the energy that is available to create those new fracture surfaces has to come from somewhere. It comes from the surrounding stress field. And so if we can kind of think of um, oh, maybe like uh, the divergence. If you think of divergence, you have something in here and you have some flux that uh, is coming out of this contour around this region that's enclosed by that cracked tip. There has to be a balance between that flux of energy and the energy to create uh, crack extension. And this is the basic idea with the contour integral. For linear elastic fracture mechanics, <clears throat> this contour is path independent, meaning we can take a circle that goes around this and closes the crack tip, you know, kind of goes around there like that, or we can take a, a square region, you know, what have you. And the energy can be calculated based on displacements and stresses and, and so forth around this contour. If you take a class in fracture mechanics, you probably get into discussion of J integrals and J contours and energy. Um, this particular class isn't quite the place to get into that much detail, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background. If you do find an element work to determine stress intensity factors for fracture mechanics situations, you will probably want to have a fracture mechanics class or uh, go to a short course on fracture mechanics or, or at least do some serious reading uh, about fracture mechanics. Now for elastic plastic fracture mechanics, things get a little more interesting. Uh, we have to be a little more careful with our J contour. We have to have that J contour enclose the plastic region but not be too far away in order to have accurate uh, results around that area. Uh, so, you know, again, just be a little extra careful with elastic plastic fracture mechanics. In our discussion, we're just going to look at linear elastic fracture mechanics again, and we're going to relate uh, the J integral to the stress intensity factor. There is a relation for that for mode 1 loading. Uh, let me write it down. If you were to calculate this energy term for mode 1, it's related to the stress intensity factor by K1 squared. Let me get rid of that C. By K1 squared. 1 minus nu squared over E. Right, so if you know this side and you know your material properties and take the square root, you can find K1. There are similar relations for the, for the other modes. Um, so that's the basic idea. Now, in Abacus, it's going to uh, assign these contours for us automatically in simple cases. But you can have very good control over contours and it, it gets to be a little tricky in three dimensions if you have a three-dimensional crack front um, or two-dimensional on a plane if you have a three-dimensional object the crack front would be two-dimensional it's fairly easy for us to deal with this uh, in the situation we're going to look at uh, a thin sheet that's a double-edged crack plate all right so before we get started with that let's take a look at the kind of the known solution and then we'll have uh, kind of an idea of what we should expect for our results. So I'm going to bring this over. Uh, I'm going to write this down, but this is from a stress intensity factor handbook. I'll show you the reference in just a moment. This is looking down the end of the plate. So there's a crack here and a crack here. The plate width is W. The, the crack length on either side, the plate width is W. The crack length on either side is A. And here's the stress intensity solution. It's the pressure or sigma square root pi a times the function of a over w which is given by this equation. Let's go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit more so you have a chance to see in it. Uh, and uh, maybe we can even select it and copy it over. Okay so it didn't, uh, didn't like it when I tried to copy it so let's just uh, write it down. Okay, so K1, 
is uh, sigma square root pi a times this function of a over w and uh, the function of a over w is equal to square root of 1 over 1 minus 2a over w times this quantity 1.122 times 1 minus a over w times uh, or minus 0 0.06 a over w squared and then plus 0 0.728 a over w cubed and whenever you see a solution like this that has these parameters to first, second, and third power, it's usually some sort of numerical fit. Um, now, in our particular case, we said this was going to be 200, and this was going to be uh, 10 millimeters. So A over W is going to be uh, 10 over 200. I believe that's 0 0.05. So I can get out my calculator, and I can calculate uh, what this uh, should be. And uh, if we use a unit tensile stress of 1 megapascal, uh, let me go ahead and calculate what the K1 ought to be in this particular case. All right, so doing that calculation, the geometry factor turns out to be 1.1235. Like I said, it should be around 1.12. The larger the crack is, the more variation you'll get from basically 1.12. And then when we multiply it by square root pi a, I get 6.2972 megapascal root millimeters. Now it's important to understand what unit system you're in. In this case, it's megapascal root millimeters. So we're going to do our finite element analysis in the Newton millimeter second system. We're going to use elastic steel properties. Doesn't really matter what uh, our modulus and Poisson's ratio is, but we'll use our standard 210,000 megapascals and 0.3 for Poisson's ratio with the isotropic linear elastic material. All right, so I think um, we have everything that we need to get ready. Let's go ahead and uh, call up Abacus and we'll go over to the models and I'm going to make a new model for this one. I tested things out ahead of time. So I'll come to call this one model 4 and we're going to go into the part module. Create a part, 2D planar deformable shell, approximate size 200. I'm going to key in our points and let's start with 0 comma 0. Um, let's see what did I say? 0 comma minus 100. Okay, there it is there. Um, 100 comma minus 100. 100 comma 0, 100 comma 100, and 0 comma 100. Let's see what we've got. All right, so we have our basic outline. Now we're going to connect these points. And we're done with that. All right, so now we have our part. Can get into properties, elasticity, elastic, 210,000 and 0.3. Create a section. We're going to do a solid homogeneous plane stress, strain thickness of 1. We're going to assign the section. I'm 
go into our assembly. We're going to instance the part. And step, we're going to create a, a step after the initial step. Time period of one is fine. All the defaults are fine. Uh, we don't really have any interactions. Um, let's, however, we do something now. Let's partition the mesh at this point. Okay, so up here, and we may have to change the module that we're working in. Uh, we're going to go up here to uh, Tools and Partition, and we're going to partition an edge. Now, sometimes I don't get this quite right. We, I might have to go back and partition the face, but we'll, we'll see. So let's say uh, edge, specify parameter by location. Let's see if this works. Okay, now here we have this thing that pops up. It says dependent part instances cannot be edited or assigned mesh attributes. Try the operation on the associated part or select make independent from the instance in the model tree. All right. So we can either change this to the part, but let's go here and get into our model tree. And uh, we're going to click on the part and make independent. All right, now let's try the partition. You see how it highlighted this edge. What I really want, if I can, it's kind of hard for me to do this because it's kind of highlighted. You see that dot, that red dot that showed up right there? create a partition and create a partition on both sides and now let's um, so we might have to change this to, to uh, face let's try this one the uh, shortest distance between two points so now I'm going to select this point and this point over here and create the partition all right, so now I have a line that goes from the left side to the other side. I probably could have started with this uh, face partition. I, I forget sometimes which one is which. Okay, now let's look at the edge. And I want to partition this edge up a little bit. Looks like it's a little crooked. Um, we could probably go back and fix that. But I don't think it will make a big difference in our results. So let's just leave it as it is. Uh, let's... Um, enter a parameter. So I'm going to go over here and select that line. Okay, and now you see this is normalized edge parameter. So now it's a hundred millimeters wide, roughly, if it was completely straight. Um, and if I put 0.1, that should be a distance of 10 millimeters. This is going to make a partition. I think this red dot right here would show where that location is. If I change this to 0.5, uh, it would put it right in the middle. If I change it to 0.9, it should put it over here. So let's try 0.1. And now we've created another partition. That's this, this little line right over here. It, it looks a little nicer. Maybe you can make it straight across. Um, but uh, I'm going to continue on. Alright, so I'm done. Alright, the next thing we want to do then is we want to get into uh, engineering features. And we're going to put in a crack. I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to assign a seam. Okay, that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to assign a seam. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to highlight that little segment. Hit done. And then uh, we're done with that. Now what that seam does is that allows it to uh, have duplicate nodes along that line in order for that crack to open up. Okay, so hopefully that, is, that seam got assigned. And now I'm going to go in here and create a crack for a contour integral. Crack name number one, that's fine. 
select the crack front Oops. Let's try that again. We're going to select, create a crack. We're going to select the crack front. Now that means the tip of the crack. Okay, so I'm highlighting just that dot. See how it turned kind of orangish. I know my cursor's highlight is right underneath of it. Specify a crack extension direction. Now I'm going to do Q vector. And here, my Q vector. It's going to start at the crack tip, so that's fine. Zero zero is fine. And select an endpoint. I'm going to select this edge over here, and uh, that is not what I wanted. I want this Q vector to point uh, over to the left. So let's try that again. Let's go zero zero for our first one. And let's go um, minus one, comma zero. Okay, so that's better. So this this arrow, this blue arrow, is pointing me toward the direction in which the crack is gonna gonna grow. Now, um, if you had a symmetry plane, you'd click this. There's a singularity button. You can do some things with some elements to make a more severe uh, kind of like we talked about one our square root r stress field near the crack tip. We're just going to go no degeneracy and uh, we're going to leave it at that. So we're going to hit OK. All right, now we need to go into our step and create some boundary conditions. We're going to do displacement boundary conditions. Um, the vertical edge is going to be our symmetry line. And on that symmetry line, we're not going to have any x displacement. And the bottom down here, we're not going to have any y displacement. It's not a symmetry condition uh, for our analysis. We just don't want to have any wide displacement there. And then in our step one, we're going to have to create a load. We're going to do a pressure on the top edge. And uh, you know, like we've been doing, we're going to put in a minus one right here. And uh, the defaults are fine. Let's see. Now we need to do a history output request. This is a little different. We have some history, but let's create a new history output request. Output 2, step 1. And we need to get in here and uh, we need to find the, the right things to check for a, a crack. Oh, so in order to do that, probably what we should do first is this domain. It says the whole model. But we're going to change this to crack. Now, if there's more than one crack, you'll you have a drop down, and then you'll select the crack. Uh, and the number of contours, let's try five. We'll talk about those in a little bit. And uh, here it says J integral. We want to do stress intensity factor determination. And, okay, maximum tangential stress. I think that uh, default should be fine. So we're going to hit OK. Now, uh, we don't really have any interactions. Uh, we're, we need to mesh this thing. Oops. So we're going to seed the mesh. Uh, I don't know. Let's do a global size of 2. We'll find out if that's good enough. And we'll mesh the part instance. Now, because I wasn't exactly uh, along this path 50-50, uh, it has kind of a weird auto mesh up here. I don't know. It just kind of did that. Uh, the last one that I tried was very nice, and I was able to get it directly across this plane. All right, I think we have everything that we need now. 
And so I'm going to come down here and create a job. We'll find out soon enough if it's not enough. Call it job 5. And we're going to submit it. It won't take very long. It'll let us know if we made any mistakes in our input. Uh, quite commonly, I forget to put in the history output request. So you might see that error come up. Sometimes I forget to mesh the part. So that'll come up. Uh, and uh, has an error. All right, let me see uh, what I can do to fix this. Okay, I think I tracked down the source of my error. Uh, so this is kind of good that we get these errors, you know, uh, um, kind of see what you can do to solve them. And so let's look at the uh, monitor. We're going to look at the message file. And here it says a numerical singularity when processing a node, and it has a degree of freedom 2 with a ratio of 300 times 10 to the 12. Typically what something like that it would indicate is that you have a rigid body motion. If you have rigid body motion, then you're going to get these singularity errors. And we see this time for increment getting smaller and smaller until it's just too small for it to do anything with. So if I have rigid body motion, that means I probably have not constrained it correctly. And if we go back, I, I just changed it already, but if we go back and look at this boundary condition 2 that's on the bottom edge, see it's, how it's, it's red down here. The bottom edge, I had selected this to be no displacement in the x direction, but what I really wanted was no displacement in the y direction. All right, so like I said, I don't like to make these kind of mistakes, but uh, I think it's fine that I did, and uh, that, this should fix it. Now, I haven't run it again yet, so let's go ahead and try this and see what we get. Should be uh, should be pretty quick. Hopefully, it'll work this time. All right, and now it's completed. All right, so I think I probably have a good uh, result here. So now I'm going to right click, and I'm going to we're going to look at the results. Again, I don't know what this key error is about. Sometimes, if you uh, overwrite the ODB file, I've noticed it gets that. And I'm going to change this over to contour results. Okay, so notice we have this uh, crack pattern, the stress field, the von Mises stress field at the crack tip. And that looks very similar now to what we had and what we had expected based on our Westergaard solution. It's a little different because we had a biaxial stress field. The biaxial stress field kind of flattens this indentation out a little bit in the von Mises contour. But again, that's a classical... Uh, stress field around a crack tip. Now, uh, if we animate this, let's see what happens. Okay, I, let's slow this down a little bit. I had it pretty slow, but All right. we can do the things that we do for ODB display. Um, let's see, view ODB display options. We can mirror it. I think along the XY plane. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, didn't do anything for us. Let's try this again. That's not quite what we want. Okay, there it is, mirroring about the YZ plane. And so this is the, the geometry that we're really modeling, is this with a, a little crack on both sides of our plate. Okay, and again, the full plate width is 200 millimeters, and the crack size here is 10 millimeters. All right, well, what we really want is we want to take a look and see what the stress intensity is. So we had job five. I'm going to open up the history output over here. And you notice because we output that history output for the crack, it has this K1 for contour one, two, three, four, five. And then it's got a K2 value. So remember K2 is kind of a, a shear uh, 
uh, stress density. So let's open up this one. We're going to double click on it. It's going to pop up a plot. And here it says uh, 3. Point, uh, looks like it's in between 3.25 and 3.3. It's a tiny little red dot right there. Okay, well that's nowhere near what, what we had calculated. Well, let's click on this contour too. Okay, now we're getting something different. It's between 6.2 and 6.3. Let's look at the third contour. It's uh, a little bit different. Here it's a little different, but it's pretty much the same. Now if we want to see the value, what we're going to do is we're going to come over here to XY Data Manager, and we're going to edit this. And this says 6.3207. So let's write that down. This is... Uh, for contour 5 if we go back to contour 4 and look at the XY data that's 3 is 6.2975. So those are all pretty close to the same. You might find contour 2 and contour 1 to be a little bit different. You tend to get a little better accuracy if you back off the crack tip a little bit. So if you go back and think of our last assignment when we took a look at the uh, stress contour along the cracked plane. When you're on that really, really steep part, it's easy to not get the right answer. Let's put it that way. If you back off that a little bit, uh, you start to get pretty good results. So even this one not, is not too bad. 6.24. And then uh, the last one, contour 1. Okay, so that's not so good at all. 3.27. So you can take the average of the last three. Um, let's call it 6.31. Let's just take the value for contour uh, number four. And let's go bring our thing up. So, okay, so we had calculated 6.29. And the FEA... came out to be about 6.31 and our units are going to be megapascal root millimeters okay so I would say that's pretty darn good all right so just kind of review uh, what we've done we made a double edge cracked plate and we applied uh, we partitioned it and along the partition line, we partitioned that line again. We inserted a seam, which allowed the nodes to separate. We applied our stresses. We put in the crack, and we put in the Q vector. And then uh, we were able to calculate the stress intensity here by applying our boundary conditions uh, as usual. Now you can do this kind of analysis in three with a three-dimensional object as well. It can be very difficult to get a nice looking mesh in three dimensions for fracture analysis. There is a very nice uh, software code. It's fairly expensive. It's a very nice software called, code called FEA Crack that will build uh, very fine crack meshes and automatically do all the stuff and it'll just spit out a stress intensity factor for you. It'll do crack growth as well. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to pause the video, I'm going to load in a, uh, a model that I had built a few years ago to take a look at a corner crack in the square bar. So that's the, uh, the next thing that we talked about. All right, let me pause here and I'll load that up. All right, so we're going to do a couple things. We're going to load this into HyperMesh first so we can take a look at it in there. Uh, and we're going to do some things to it. Uh, but we'll also load it into Abacus. But in the end, we're going to run it 
as an input file through the CAE interface. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last time. So I'm going to go File. Uh, now I selected Abacus uh, Standard 3D for my import type. But I'm going to import a solver deck. And uh, it's this one that I want to import. I will give this to you uh, to play around with. So we're going to import it. And uh, it has a couple things. A couple things have been removed. We're going to close this up. And uh, see all these, these giant triangles? Those are symbols for boundary conditions. And they're just huge. I really don't know why they're, they're so huge. But um, what we can do is we can get in here and we can turn those off. See, I think it's this one. We'll find out soon enough. Okay, yeah, it is. So it's this load collector thing. Uh, we're going to turn that off. All right, so there's our component. Um, let's fit this thing. And what we're looking at is uh, the bottom surface of a square bar, and here is the crack. So some people call this uh, a thumbnail crack or a semi-elliptical crack, semi-elliptical quarter crack. You know, it's a quarter of a semi to half of a semi-ellipse, I guess. Um, but there's different names for this. But the idea is that this is where this very fine mesh region is uh, where that crack front is at. Let's, uh, let's find out what the dimensions are on this thing. Let's pull a couple distances off. So it looks like an inch and a half. This was an analysis I did uh, in support of a failure analysis a few years back. And I'll show you the paper for that goes along with this. Uh, and if, if we get a chance this semester, we'll also do a, um, a plasticity analysis on this. Not with a crack, but uh, with, without the crack. Okay, so it's an inch and a half square. And uh, maybe I can rotate this in space. So this is a three-dimensional solid. And see this, this detail. Uh, this is just a beautiful crack front that's been put in here. And this has been done automatically by FEA Crack. They have kind of a basic uh, thing they call a crack tube. And that's the shape that we see right here. And you can distort this crack tube into lots of different geometries. Uh, we'll see when we look at the FEA Crack demo some of the things that they can they can do with this idea of a crack tube. And you can specify all kinds of parameters, the number of elements along this direction on the crack tube and everything. So now, instead of having that plate that we just looked at with a single edge crack, it was just kind of a, a thing that was growing in one dimension, this entire arc right here is the crack front. And this crack may increase its ellipticity, its degree of ellipticity, if you if you wish, or it could grow in a uniform manner. It can calculate, FEA crack with Abacus can calculate the stress density factor as a function of position along this crack front. They usually uh, indicate that in terms of an angular measure uh, and uh, you know, go from 0 to 90 degrees. So uh, let's bring this into Abacus and we'll take a look at some of the things that they've set up. But there are some things in there that Abacus CAE will not import correctly. And we'll talk about how to get around that. So that's what this is. So I went ahead. Let's go ahead and just make a new one. Let me delete this. And I'm going to uh, go uh, File, Import, a model, and we're only just going to select this file that I'll give to you. And look here, it says, warning, the following keywords are not supported by the input file reader. Um, I don't think they'll ever do it. They haven't done it in 10 years. They're not probably not ever going to do this. But L file, L print, node file, node print, and preprint are not supported. Those are things that FEA Crack puts in to print out the values of the J contour. FEA Crack then reads the data file that's generated, it's a text file, and uh, gives a graphical representation of the stress density along the crack front. Okay, so this is the model in Abacus. Uh, let's uh, get in here. We got the materials. Uh, this is the 
uh, modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, this looks like it's in the pounds and inches system for steel. Uh, we have a section card, we have an assembly, we have a bunch of sets. We have crack face elements. Let's see if we can find those by zooming in on it. And so I double clicked on that kind of fast. I changed it over to this assembly context. So there's the crack face elements. Okay, so these elements would not be constrained. These would be the ones that be free to go in the in that direction. We have some crack face nodes, crack front nodes. You see that line? That's the crack front. We have some contour front, same thing I guess. Uh, we have some other elements. And then you see here, here's a J1, J2, J3. See how it's got each individual node along that front and it's going to calculate the J integral there. Okay. Now if we expand this out, it keeps going. There's only so many it takes in a set. We have node flags. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what those are for. Uh, might be for dis applying known displacements or something like that. Uh, but uh, some of these different groups you can take a look at. Now they don't do a, a crack like we did. Okay, so they're, they're kind of doing this all by, I say by hand but it's an automated process where they write the input file as they like it. So let's see, it has a step. Let's see what's in it. We have a step one. It has some boundary conditions. Okay, so fixed on the bottom in the Z direction. And in the Y direction. And in the X down there. And uh, let's see what the loads are. And it's a distributed force, it looks like, of a certain value. Now, that value isn't necessarily important uh, for us, but it's kind of like what we did. It gives them some force to it. Right. So it has some field output requests. It has some history output requests. Specifically, there's one for the crack. It's based on contour integral 1. Okay, every in 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 increments and it has five contours for that and they're doing a J integral type evaluation. All right. Now if we were to run this it wouldn't come up with anything um, it would come up with the data but it's not in a very convenient format. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our job menu over here and what I've done is I copied this file to a new name. Um, what we want to do is, uh, let's see, I'm going to create a job with a source as the input file. And uh, here it is right here. Okay, so this is just a copy of this one. I'll give you both of these to avoid any confusion, but that's just a copy. So I'm going to hit OK on this and uh, continue full analysis, uh, immediate submission, and then now I'm going to, uh, that was the completed job, let me delete that. And let me submit this one. And it won't take long. So all these things that are down here that that CAE didn't import, those things are going to put some information into our .dat file that will be related to helping us find the uh, value of the J integral and then through that equation the value of the stress intensity factor along that crack front. All right, Let me pause here until this is done. Alright, so now it's done. Let's uh, get into the temp folder and let's look at the .dat file. Okay, here it is right here and uh, like I said I like to use Crimson Editor. 
I'm going to bring that in here. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, remember we had five contour integrals in there. And J1, J2, J3, that's every node along that crack front has a value for the contour at 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. Now, uh, J1 for contour 1 is a little bit smaller than what it is uh, for 3, 4, and 5. So you probably want to exclude the first two, just like we did in the very simple example. Uh, J2, that point, is 0 0.7790, and uh, it stabilizes out to looks like 0.84. 1 or 842 and every one of these points then you can evaluate the stress intensity factor along the crack front All right. so this uh, FEA crack is really pretty handy it's pretty useful uh, if I had the full version of FEA crack we wouldn't even have to look at the .dat file it would bring that in and tell us the results uh, for us all right, so we wanted to do that, but I also want to do something else. Let's take a look at this input file that we ran. Um, let's see. It was um, this one right here. I can find the .inp file. It's sorted by date. Let's sort it by name. Oh, I guess it's in my other directory. Let me get let me get into there. There it is. AM535. Uh, and this one. Alright, so I'm gonna give you this one and this one. And I'm going to take this one and I'm going to rename it. to uh, say no elements and no nodes. I'm going to bring that into Crimson Editor. Anything you see here with two stars is a comment. So we can leave all that stuff in here. It defines the sets. But now we get into this where it says the nodal coordinates. I'm going to highlight this and I'm going to select all the nodes there's quite a bit here I'm hitting page down I'm going to pause it and uh, find the end of the uh, element list here Okay, so I scroll down, I have my shift button pressed. So I'm going to highlight all this and I'm going to delete all the nodes and all the elements. But I'm going to leave everything else in this file. Okay, I'm going to hit save. All right, now I want us to look in the manual at a particular keyword. So we're going to open up our documentation and we're going to look for the keyword manual. Here it is, the Keywords Reference Guide. And we're going to look at uh, Include. All right, so star include references an external file contam containing Apicus input data. All right, required parameter, input, 
set this parameter equal to the name of the file containing the input data. See input syntax rules in your analysis user's guide. All right, so uh, we can take a look at that real quick, just to make sure we have it right for Windows. Um, should be uh, some file naming guide. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wing it here a little bit. Uh, I don't think we need. Uh, we might need quotes, but I'm not exactly sure. But we'll find out here uh, soon enough. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to here, and we're going to put in the line star include, make sure you spell it right. Let's go back and look at our manual, make sure I have the syntax correct. Uh, comma input equal something else. Right. Let's see if there's an example with that. There may not be. Let's go to our main documentation. No, we don't like the asterisks. Um, yeah, it's hard to know what we've got. So let's just go with this and, and we'll fix it if it's not right. But we're going to put in input equal. Uh, let's try the quotes. Bar.txt. All right, let's save that. Let's go back to our hypermesh. And let's say we really like this mesh, but we really wanted a rectangular bar, not a square bar. All right, so let's go in here. Uh, we're going to go to Tools. I'm going to go to Scale, Nodes, Displayed. And let's see, the Z scale is fine. Uh, let's say we want this to be... Um, have an X scale of 2. All right. Now all of a sudden we have a, a mesh that maybe is, is better to better suited for what we want. We just scaled it. All the node numbers and all the element numbers are exactly the same. Now we're going to export this mesh. Go on the export solver deck. And uh, Let's get it in the right spot. Rectangular bar. I'm going to call it that .txt. Everything that's displayed, and then now we have to hit the export button. Okay, let's get in here. There it is. Open with our large text editor. It'll take a moment to get all that in there. Okay, it has some comments. It has a heading. We're going to get rid of the heading. Get rid of any blank lines. You don't want to leave any blank lines. And I'm just going to scroll down here. down to the bottom. We don't need any of this material data. We don't need any of this step data. All this stuff we'll get rid of. And get rid of that blank line. Make sure it ends on this spot right here. Okay, now let's rename this to bar.txt. So what should happen now when we run this through Abacus it's going to, we're going to run this file. Okay. It's going to do all this stuff that's in here. And when it gets down to that include, it should read in the bar.txt file and then continue on with all this other part of the job.
All right, let's see if that'll work. I haven't tried this ahead of time, so uh, fingers crossed uh, it'll all work out. So we're going to go back to uh, jobs. We're going to create a job from an input file, and we are going to select uh, the input file. Uh, let's see where I put that. Uh, here it is, this one. No elements and nodes. And we're going to submit this. And I'm going to pause the video here until it's uh, done. Oh, I didn't like that. Uh, let's see what the problem was. I might not have liked those quotes. And the uh, following file could not be located bar.txt. Uh, okay. Let's try something. It probably is looking for it in the temp folder. So let's go here and let's uh, cut it out of here and let's paste it into my temp folder. Let's try this again. If I would put a fully qualified path, it uh, probably could have stayed where I had it. Okay, so now it is running, and uh, I'm going to pause the video until it completes, and we'll see what this looks like. Okay, so it's completed successfully. Let's take a look at the results. Now we have that mirroring going on. Now let's turn that off. Okay, so now we have a rectangular beam, a bar with a corner crack. Okay, there's our stress. See how the crack opened up a little bit. And if we go back to our temp folder and look at our dat file, bringing this one in, and go down to the bottom. Look at our J contours. See how these values have changed. Okay, I think it was uh, 0.7 or something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, but now, by changing the degree of the ellipse for that crack front, we've changed the the J contour values and the associated uh, stress intensity factors along the crack front. All right, so that's kind of handy, and this include feature is very nice. Particularly, uh, maybe you want to do a lot of different jobs. Maybe you want to have uh, write a program to uh, write a lot of things automatically for your steps, but you want to um, use the same mesh every time. Or like we did, we're kind of altering our mesh using the same steps. So uh, that, that include kind of separates those things out. It kind of keeps things in a, in a nice um, organized way particularly for automated analyses. So if you're doing parametric studies, it's really handy. All right, so let's see what else we wanted to do. Uh, I think we wanted to talk a little bit about the FEA crack software. Let's save this file. Let's open this one up. Uh, so we, we did the double edge crack plate. We did the 3D model with the edge crack. And then, um, yeah, we want to talk about the FEA Crack Demo. Now, this FEA Crack Demo is available to you on our Box account. I don't know if I have that brought up here anymore, but it's available to us on our Box account. Uh, I also need to show you real quick the uh, reference that I used for the, uh, the Crack Plate. Um, let's see, I guess this just looks like an appendix from somewhere. Maybe I can find the link. Uh, just to document that, um, where are we at? Here it is, this link, uh, Unican, I don't know what ES is, uh, Estonia maybe. Um, and uh, then we want to do the FEA Crack Demo. So the FEA Crack Demo software is available on our Box account. You can download it 
I'm going to start it up by selecting it. And here it says uh, no authorization for product. That is to be expected since we don't have a license for it. So we're going to run in demo mode. We will have an engineer, Greg Thorwell from Quest Integrity, come and in, in, uh, give a uh, Skype lecture to our class. And so it comes up with this, uh, and it's uh, the interface uh, looks a little dated to me, but uh, but here we have the analysis type, focused crack mesh for J integral analysis, or you can do these other things, uh, crack growth and whatnot. Here's the unit system, power intensity PSI. You click continue, put in an analysis name. Uh, let's call it demo. Structural shape, flat plate, cylindrical shell. These are the basic features. Elbows. They do a lot of work for the um, oil pipeline industry. So they have a lot of things that do with uh, that sort of thing. Here's CT specimen. So you can do that if you want. Um, perforated plate, overlapping plates, uh, plate, flat plate with a hole. Let's do something like, uh, let's do an elbow. Well, elbow is kind of complicated to set up. Let's do, um, all right, let's just do the flat plate. Weld, no weld, single weld, different materials, all that. Okay, so you just hit the, if you're satisfied with that, you hit this. Build the mesh in the plus or minus Z direction. See the green area there, that cyan colored? That is the crack front, and it says the model is quarter symmetric, or you can change this to half symmetric or fully symmetric or whatnot. Uh, perpendicular to stress, the center of the plate, and we have some mesh options you can put in. And these are all the things that that uh, control the crack tube. Okay, and uh, you can specify all these different things. We are just going to select the defaults. You can specify the crack length. Okay, so maybe the crack is uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 inches for 2C, and maybe it's 0.1 inches for the crack depth A. Single crack on the surface, and we can do all these different options. Now, maybe we have a uh, half plate width, maybe of 10 inches, a half plate length of 20 inches, and a plate thickness of 1 inch. We can put boundary conditions. Uh, you can do all this kind of stuff. Uh, you can apply constraints, unconstrained. Um, you know, you can put pressure on the crack front, put loading pins. We'll just hit OK for that. And um, let's see, specify material properties. They have a little bit of a library in here. So A36 structural steel. So that's that's that. And let's go down to build mesh. Let's see if it'll build it for us. Uh, let's see, it's looking for an FEA crack data file. Um, let me pause here and see what else I can find. Okay, so it was just wanting a name. And since this is a demo version, I think it'll generate the mesh, but it's not going to uh, let us save the mesh or anything like that. So right now it says generating mesh, please wait. Let's see if it does anything. If not, we'll cancel this and try something a little different. All right, so I got a little bit of an error. Uh, let's uh, let's try something different. Let's make this point oh five. Okay, demo version only. Let's see if uh, that makes any difference. 
All right, so I finally found some parameters that would work. Uh, let me go back. Uh, well, I'll show you in, in a little bit. But if on your computer it doesn't have enough memory, what you can do is you can make this uh, smaller, uh, much smaller geometry. Let's see if I can zoom in. Now this is a um, it's a little different than maybe what we're used to. So this has uh, about 50,000 nodes and around 43, 44,000 elements. So let's zoom in and uh, some way that we can get this custom zoom. Okay. So custom zoom, you just kind of drag around this and that'll zoom in. And there's our crack. And again, very similar to the one that we looked at. Uh, we have this crack front and again by changing values you can you can change that let me show you what I ended up doing to get this to work I went into geometry crack and uh, in configuration under mesh options I changed this to eight noted bricks and I changed this number maximum number of elements maximum number of nodes in the mesh and so if you don't get anything to show up the first time, uh, play around with those numbers and that'll help out. Now we can't do anything else with this because uh, this is the demo. But I did want to show you this. It's a, it's a very useful tool. And uh, hopefully we'll to learn a little bit more about this in class as well. All right, so I think that's enough. Uh, so this will be your second in the third series of uh, talking about cracks in Abacus. Uh, the next thing we want to do then, our, our uh, next homework assignment will be on uh, XFEM. All right, have a good one.